All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 16th day of April in the year of our Lord. Let's see, where am I? I get centered here. Uh, 2022. Uh, the other couple days ago, Mike Winger, uh, that's the name of his YouTube channel, who was a pastor, a uh, young guy, pretty moderate, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he's a good guy. I, I, I think he's dependable. Uh, I don't have anything bad to say about him. I think I could, uh, obviously, there's things I would probably disagree with him or or perhaps um, take a little bit different approach to certain issues. I noticed the other day he did a fourth in a series on women in ministry, and he is opposed to that, although uh, he, like I, believe probably that uh, uh, unless the Scripture is explicit in prohibiting something that we should... Uh, go on the lenient side, uh, so not uh, pushing things beyond what the Scripture requires, especially when it's like that. We should always err on the side of freedom because we are called to freedom in Christ, not slavery. That's why John MacArthur is wrong. John MacArthur likes being a slave, and he wants everybody to be his slave. So he wrote a whole book on it. Being slaves of Christ. Well, there is an attitude about uh, of being a servant because Christ uh, became a servant too, made himself a servant. But it's a voluntary thing. It's not slavery. No, we're free. Do not the Scripture uh, Paul says, "Do not become the slaves of men." You have to remember that your pastor starts acting like you're a slave. Time to kiss him goodbye and show him he's not your master. Jesus Christ is. Even that, we are the children of God, sons of God. And we're not called to be slaves of God. We're sons of God. But a good son has a, an attitude of service toward his father because he loves him. It's out of love, not out of bondage, out of chains. So, Anyway, Mike Winger has a, uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, let's get over here. Okay, um, a video, were women apostles or elders or deacons? Now, he begins with a quote from N.T. Wright, and I probably should do a separate video on that. I don't think, I didn't listen to the whole video, but I'm not sure. I don't think uh, Mike Winger got into that because it's a Greek issue. Uh, it has to do with uh, N.T. Wright, uh, who is a noted scholar, even if he's notably wrong on the gospel, because he is, his reinterpretation of Paul, he's, he's, uh, stay away from N.T. Wright. Uh, he will deceive you. Uh, he's able to deceive, he sounds biblical, but then he's not. And he uses his scholarship to deceive people. Uh, he doesn't actually know what he's talking about. Uh, it doesn't matter, uh, it's, it's, as far as the Bible is concerned. So we, scripture, Christians, we look to the scriptures. We look to what God has said, not to what scholars have said. Because scholars are often or usually the enemy of the church, just as they were in Jesus' day. The scribes were often the enemies of Christ. And they were called the scribes or the lawyers because copying the Bible tends to make you an expert in what it's written in it. Uh, yes. But anyway, uh, my uh, N.T. Wright, at the beginning of that uh, video at uh, uh, Mike Winger, uh, talks about uh, proof that women were in positions as apostles because of a woman supposedly named Junius. Uh, Junia, excuse me, Junia. Uh, the problem is there's two forms of that word. There's Junias, the masculine, it's a gendered language, 
you know Spanish, you know what I'm talking about, or most other languages. Uh, and junia is a feminine form. Uh, the translators vary on that <coughs> because they don't. The translators are often are not very knowledgeable on scripture as a whole. The problem is with translating it as junia, fem feminine, it runs afoul of, uh, you know, of Paul. <laughs> Uh, but the fact is, I looked at that and said, okay, this sounds like a good argument. If it's actually Junia and she was actually an apostle, then we have to figure out how to get Paul and, uh, uh, let's see, that's an act. Well, is that an act? No, that Paul and Paul to agree with them, <laughs> to agree with each other. I think that's in uh, Corinthians. Which one? I can't remember. At the end, the greeting section. Uh, but the issue I looked it up in the Greek, and I don't know if I want to do that now. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll look it up right now. And Juni. Uh, now, here is what it says, and we're going to look at some multiple translations here. Uh, King James is in error here. It says junia. Well, technically it's not an error. It just doesn't agree with what Paul teaches. Uh, when you translate, you don't want to translate a scripture so it is in contradiction with scripture. That should be pretty clear, unless you're an enemy of God, which is what a lot of the modern scholars are. Uh, salute Andro, uh, Andronicus and junia, my kinsmen. Now, if you look at the New American Standard, greet Andronicus and Junias. Masculine, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners. Now, see, uh, N.T. Wright would have Junia, a female apostle, being a fellow prisoner with Paul. In the same jail? I don't know. They usually didn't throw women into prison, I don't think. That's a waiting trial. They could have. I don't know. But here's the issue. Why does it translate it at Junia in King James and New King James, which tends not to vary from the King James, unless they have a good reason, and Junias in the New American Standard and Young's Literal, which is based on the same Greek. This is not a textual uh, uh, situation at all in the, uh, the Greek. There, there's a variance, but it's only a spelling variance that has to do with, uh, uh, let's see, uh, it's a uh, uh, come about, uh, begin, or come to be. Uh, it's uh, which is an uh, orus there. It looks like anyway. Uh, so that's just a slight form variance there. But it has nothing to do with the subject. With see, we have here. Here is the words. Andronicon and Ionian. Now, that's. The the ending here of both Junias and Junia, the feminine and the masculine in the accusative or direct object grammar, is the same ending. So the masculine form of Junias or in the feminine form of Junia, both are written identical. There's a little um, accent mark there, but there was no accent marks in the original Greek. There was no punctuation at all, really. There is no spacing between the words, and everything was uppercase. Uh, but here, see, you cannot tell from the word itself whether it's supposed to be junius masculine or junia feminine, because it's in the accusative, and the accusative has identical endings in all three cases, uh, masculine, neuter, and feminine. And I hope I'm right on that. But I looked it up on my... Uh, case card the other day to make sure so uh, so N.T. Wright who is a scholar noted scholar pa passes as an evangelical scholar obviously should know this 
So either he doesn't bother to look in the scripture, or he doesn't care, because he has got a point. If you have a point of view, see, that, that point of view will, in, will cause you to see what you want to see in the scripture and to not see what you don't want to see. That's why you have to rely on the Holy Spirit and prayer to guide you to, to overcome your personal biases and to give you insight into his word. But his insight will always agree with the text and the context. Always! The Holy Spirit does not interpret the Bible contrary to a proper understanding of the Bible. He doesn't do revisions or take passages out of context and use them for something that it's not teaching. If somebody's doing that, they're not being led by the Spirit of God or by the Word of God. You can't separate the two. So, so the, uh, the case of Junias or Junia, there is no grammatical reason to translate it as feminine. King James was in error. There's every reason not to translate as translate it as feminine because there are no female apostles. Which women did Jesus call as apostles? He didn't. Which men did he call to be mothers? He didn't. Yikes. Okay, so let's go over to uh, deal with. The, the argument over here now. So I just wanted to point that out. That's at the the uh, the NT right clip is at the beginning of Mike uh, Winger's were women apostles, elders, or deacons. Deacons. I think th th we have to qualify that there are deaconesses mentioned a feminine form, but deacon just means servant. Now, when the seven deacons were appointed in Acts, I don't think that they were always directly involved in, in distributing the food so much as overseeing the distribution of food and, and other needs, which is a different thing. What oversight and leadership, um, uh, even if others, see, you could have deaconess as women. There's, there's situations where you wouldn't want men actually doing the 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 in-house work you know uh, there's a ca case for women in certain positions and men in certain positions but overseeing the work it was a response that the seven deacons were called to make sure the distribution was done justly in that situation in jerusalem so that's a different thing they are that that is a a, a position of authority not necessarily the ones that are doing the, the, the on-ground work, so to speak. I mean, they had thousands of Christians in the city. So, yeah, and make sure it gets distributed equitably is what the purpose of the deacons were. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, but the word, because it simply means servant, um, not slave, by the way, uh, uh, a minister, a minister, one who serves the church, uh, that word can be used. It's like apostles is used in a in a particular sense and in a broader sense too. So you could have uh, definitely could have female deaconesses ministering uh, in the church in appropriate circumstances that might not be appropriate for men at all. And then you could have, but as far as overseeing the distribution in general, uh, no, no. Uh, women do not order men around, It's uh, as we'll see. In fact, in the Old Testament, and I believe it's Isaiah, it might be in Jeremiah, God says, when women rule over you, and that was a sign of God's judgment. Women and children rule over you. That's a sign of God's judgment. That's not a sign of blessing. So it ha we'll see why that is. So let's take a look at the winger thing over here. And I think I need to mute my mic here. But Mike Winger agrees with me. He debunks Calvinism in at least two of his videos that I've seen. And 
I'm not sure what his role on cessationism, to be honest with you, but uh, certainly in this role of the women, that's the third item I talk probably the most about, the role. If this guy is a, a, a continuationist, that might explain why he's, why he's so far off on so many things. Because continuationists do not have a high view of Scripture. They, they rely on direct inspiration, supposedly, of the Holy Spirit that overrides Scripture, which is, would explain what's wrong with this guy here, besides his taste in shirts. I'm joking about that. I'm not joking about the problem with uh, um, the charismatic movement and Pentecostal movement and not restricting, and not only these, it occurs in other denominations too, not a holding strictly to sola scriptura, or as I've been accused of, scriptura nuda, <laughs> naked scripture. Yeah, it's from people that claim to be sola scriptura, but have all kinds of creeds and confessions and, and books on theology and everything else too. Sorry, that's not sola scriptura. Uh, the scripture, according to Paul, <laughs> in Second Timothy, is sufficient for every good work for the man of God, that he might be fully equipped. That means he don't need anything else, including seminary and university and that kind of stuff. ...of men and women in the church today, based on what the Bible says. And so he and I will have a slight disagreement on the conclusions of interpreting Scripture and the key passages relating to that. But I want to show you something real quick. More than a slight difference. <laughs> okay, we're in 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to scroll down to 15 and 16, verse 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord's salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Peter's talking about what Paul wrote to brothers and sisters in Christ. And he called it scripture. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which that which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So here is Peter uh, admitting, depending on what Bible version you'll see, you know, it, it basically is the same meaning, and that is some of what Paul writes is confusing. And some people who just don't know what the heck they're talking about, um, or even possibly for um, ulterior motives, will twist the word of Paul, the writings of Paul, to mean something else. And that's why, although this is not a core essential of the faith, this whole role of women in the church, uh, it, it's, it's still a hotly debated item. And somebody's wrong. <laughs> You know, I firmly do not believe it is me, and I have no ulterior motive, and I'm certainly not new at this when it comes to reading. Well, actually, you do have an a, a ulterior motive. That's to be popular on YouTube and to be popular with the women and to go with the world because that's what this is all about, conforming to the world. For almost 2,000 years, there were no pastor, female pastors or bishops, elders, uh, people in authority in the church that were women. Now, there were people that s sometimes were uh, mystics and things like that, but uh, not among Orthodox Christianity. Only among the heretics did you find anything like that. And they were usually prophetesses. And prophetess is not a person that speaks with their own authority. They are supposedly vessels for the Spirit of God, and it is God speaking, not them. So that's different. That's different than what a pastor does. A pastor is speaking out of himself. He's not, he, he may be guided, hopefully guided by the Holy Spirit, but he's not speaking as a prophet where the Holy Spirit, where his words are directly inspired by God. And therefore, if they are false, it is time to stone them, at least in the Old Testament. But uh, also, I wanted to point out that you, when you begin your argument by trying to undercut the authority of the person that you're going to be looking at, 
Uh, so bringing up Peter's uh, statement here about this passage being hard to understand, or not this passage, Paul's writings being difficult to understand. So you start by, as they say, poisoning the well. So you're, you're trying to tear down Paul's authority, and the fact that you apparently are charismatic means you do not hold to Sola Scriptura. You uh, have an, If the Holy Spirit moves you contrary to the Scripture, you will go with the so-called Holy Spirit. Now, I've seen that for many, many years. And I was in the charismatic movement for quite a few years, and it's bunk. Too many false prophets. The Internet's full of false prophets. The Bible and understanding it. So uh, I'm not unlearned, and I am not, uh, uh, I, you know, for instance, um, I do this channel for free in my spare time. Did he say he's not unlearned? We'll, we'll have a look at that. It's not my real job. And I don't ask for donations or anything. I don't know. Maybe one day it'll be a full-time thing, and I will. I don't, I, I don't have a crystal ball on that. But probably not, if I had to guess. That's not my goal. I just like to share what I learn in the Bible with other people and what, what, what I am passionate to talk about and sharing the gospel. Now, let's go over here. First Timothy 2. This is the one of the, one of the women in the pulpit is what he's passionate about. The most common controversial, or this section right here, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to you. It hasn't been controversial until, well, about the middle of the 19th century with, in the holiness movement, people like uh, um, mm, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, whose wife eventually persuaded him to allow her to preach because she could write a better sermon than him. So, see, what this is all based on, this is sort of jumping a little ahead here, but this is why it, it happens in the charismatic movement, it happens in the holiest movement. The, uh, everything uh, comes from John Wesley, because John Wesley did not hold to Sola Scriptura. John Wesley had his, what he called his quadrilateral. He held to the authority of Scripture, that was number one, but then he also added, let's see, what did he add? Tradition, reason, and experience. So if you have a religious experience, that trumps Scripture. And that's why Wesley's theology and his life was such a mess, in my estimation. And his life was. It was a mess. His theology was a mess. He was about as stable as a yo-yo, up and down, up and down, because his experience formed part of the revelation of God in his life. Now, Experience, reason, and uh, uh, tradition does affect how we understand Scripture, but those things generally affect it negatively. We have to judge experience, reason, and tradition by the Scripture. If you add it to the Scripture, it destroys Scripture, just like in Roman Catholicism. They say the Bible is inspired by God and infallible in their official documents, Yet, because they make tradition equal to the Scripture, and the bishops and the pope as the, as the proper and sole interpreter of Scripture, they nullify Scripture. And it becomes whatever the pope says, which is codified in Vatican I. Vatican I also acknowledged the infallibility of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture, but they nullified it and they made that pope the absolute head. Usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Usurp authority is from the Greek word authentine. The only time in Scripture... Let me uh, pull myself out of the picture here so you can see it. That version, that Greek version of, of authority is used. And authentine means to illegally t or take by force. No, it doesn't. See, he's getting his, his understanding from the King James. The King James says usurp authority, and that's a correct translation. 
But this word, since this word is only used once in the entire Bible, it's one of those words that's it's hard to to establish a, a true meaning uh, because you don't have other examples to look to. However, it, it its root meaning is uh, two words. It comes from autos, self, like automobile or self-moving vehicle or or automatic something that runs itself or uh, um, and the word hentes which is an obsolete word and it has to do with worker so it's a literally a self worker a person who who is under their own authority is what the idea is that's where they, they get the word usurp it's authority that is not theirs legitimately just like we talk about usurping authority in government, where, like the president of the United States or a governor usurps authority and locks down the whole country. You know, that's usurping authority. They have no legal authority to do that under the Constitution or the laws of the states. I know I looked at the laws of Illinois, the emergency powers, that wasn't among them. I mean, they could do a lot of things, but they couldn't uh, put you under house arrest, essentially. They weren't granted that authority. They just took it. That's usurping authority. It's not authority that belongs to you. And that is the, uh, the sense in this used here is that women taking authority that is not rightfully theirs. It's not taking it by force. It has nothing to do with it. You can usurp authority by taking it by force. It's called a coup. But that's not what's happening here. That's not the idea. And we'll see that as we go on a little bit. And it's not a rightful authority. It's a wrongful type of authority. Um, and so that's why in the King James Bible, the word usurp authority is inserted because usurp means to illegally or by force take. And then you add the word authority to it, and then you have basically a perfect translation of See, he does not even he doesn't know what he's talking about. He simply does not know what he's talking about. The word authority is not there at all. Hentes is worker. It's not authority. I mean, if he'd simply looked up at the uh, Strong's notes someplace, you don't have to go down in some sophisticated library of uh, uh, Greek lexicon because uh, you're not going to find any authoritative things anyway because it's only used once in the whole Bible. That's a problem with it. So, but it, it, the idea is self-worker, someone who operates out of their own authority. They're not under anyone else. They operate in their own name. They're the one in charge. There's no one above them. See, that's the problem. So. Let's let's we'll look at we'll look in the details in this. I'll let him go on a little bit longer. Of authentine, from the Greek, um, exousia is the Greek word used in for authority every other time in Scripture, which is well over a hundred times. Authentine shows up once, and this is it. You think Paul? Again, authentine doesn't have the idea, it's, it's not a translation of, the, it's not a word for authority. It's a word for a person that is that works without proper authority. That's why exousia is a word for authority, right, power. Dunamis is power. You can have the, the power to do something but not have the authority. You have the power to take a gun and shoot somebody. But unless you have the authority to do that, it's unlawful. Correct? A police officer or a regular person under certain circumstances has the lawful authority to take action. But he doesn't have that he does not have the authority out of himself. It is granted to him by somebody else like the law. Who wrote Exousia and other places. Think of the, uh, Jesus said, I have been given all authority under heaven and earth. That's a rightful authority he has. Exousia is the word used in Greek, not authentine. This of course, but if these, aren't, we, these words aren't related. They're not from the same word family at all. 
this this man is simply uh, demonstrating he's not familiar with Greek at all. <sighs> this is the only time it said, but that's not the reason I really went here. I'm just giving you a, a view of a King James Bible translation versus modern translations that say, um, like modern translations, they have a bias, right? In, in Mike Winger's first video, he talked about inserting your bias. Well, translators do that too. In verse 12, they, they have, uh, nor to have authority over men instead of the man. And by the way, this is a clear reference. Adam, verse 13, for Adam and Eve, uh, for Adam was formed, formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. It was in the transgression. What is Adam and Eve's relationship with one another? Hello, they were married, right? So Paul... Paul here, th this is why one of the reasons why this you should not listen to this guy, because he does not know what he's talking about. Uh, the scripture explains it if you'll simply read it and believe what God says. So let's go over to, let me, I'll bring up my copy here. <laughs> so I'll explain a little bit about this. Uh, that's not the right one. Where am I? How did I get over there? Okay. Here it is. There we go. Okay. I'll read the New King James here. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Over a man. See, the King James says the man. Now, there is no definite article in the Greek here. What we have in the Greek... And there's a reason why we, you know, when something like this comes up, especially when people try to, to dazzle, dazzle you with this, the uh, uh, bovine excrement kind of stuff, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. So here, if we look at the Greek, uh, what we find is, uh, uh, let's see, how can I explain this? Uh, okay. It starts with the word teach. Did I ask uh, Cain? Did did I ask? Uh, it means to 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 teach. And then it says, uh, "It's well, actually, it starts here." But the woman, the Greek Greek. It isn't dependent on uh, word order like English is. So it's it depends on other things. It's more like if you know Spanish, then you're probably pretty good <laughs> as far as some of this stuff. Okay, so it says, I, I, onk, epi, uh, repo. Okay, I, I do not permit. The woman, or woman, a singular. So it's, I do not permit a woman or female to teach. To teach. So this is not just about authority. This is about the, about the role of teaching. Now, you see, you have to, there is a, 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 a connector. This is a a single part of the sentence here, the first clause. I do not permit the woman to teach or to uh, exercise, I'll do it this way, exercise authority out of herself, out of her position over man. Uh, male. See, this is andros. It's not anthropos. It's andros. This is a, 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 a the woman gunai, and anthropo, uh, andros, uh, uh, aner. So it's man and woman. It can also mean husband and wife. Interchangeable. It doesn't. Uh, it's just a gendered uh, anthropos is generally man or men, but it's usually in a generic sense unless it's particular in context. 
but the word oner or andros here means specifically a male. It can't mean a female. And uh, a gune is a woman, period. No other possibility there. So that's what we have here. I do not permit them to teach or to exercise um, authority, to uh, uh, authority that they don't have, authority that comes out of themselves. So now remember that Jesus, the Scripture says, Paul writes that the 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 husband or the man is the head of the woman. You have the same kind of words here. Now, obviously, the man is not the head of somebody else's wife, okay? So in, inside the family, yeah, the, the man is above in, in the chain of command. This is not above as in qualitative, but rather in the chain of command. If you've been in the military, you know all about the chain of command and how you don't exercise authority that's not yours and how you don't jump the chain. <laughs> you don't bypass, you don't go up the chain and skip things in between. It's just not done, uh, or you'll be in trouble. So here's, so we, Paul says that a woman, he's talking about teaching. He's not talking about a husband and wife. Although the words can mean husband and wife, he's talking about the church. or to exercise authority over man. See, man, a singular, or, or a gune, a singular woman, is in the Greek that, just like in English, we can use the word man as an as a individual or man as a generic man, right? A category of human beings, man. And uh, a, a woman as a category, a type, a particular kind of, of human being. Or it can be an individual. That happens all the time in English and in Greek. So the fact that it and the fact that it has the in the King James means absolutely nothing. There is no the there. Uh, that is a. See, there's no indefinite article. So the man is a uh, thing that was added in the. English of the King James. It doesn't mean it's improper. You just cannot draw. See, if you simply check other translations and compare them and you realize you're using one particular translation with a particular reading, you are misinterpreting the Scripture. You don't look at the oddities. You look at what they all have in common. So this man does not have a clue what he's talking about. But let's look at it. I do not allow or permit a woman to teach. It doesn't say, it, there's no, uh, the only way you get to have a, teach a man is to go into the second part. So it's to, to teach or to have authority over man. If there's a, a controversy in this verse, it would be about whether women can teach other women. And we're told that older women are to teach younger women to be good wives. But there's a lot of reasons where you, why you would not allow a person, uh, a woman teacher, to teach in general. Somebody like Beth Moore, I would never permit her to teach in a church. Especially wives. Why? Because their husband hasn't, hasn't given permission. There's one reason. Why would you like a rebel like Beth Moore teaching your wife to... And I, I chewed out a pastor for that because they were having a, a bi women's Bible study and they were using Beth Moore material. And I said, do you know what's in that material? I called the pastor out on it personally, privately. I wasn't a member of the church, but I, I thought it was bad enough. I was thinking about joining the church. No. It's, <laughs> but it's, it's, wait a minute. Uh, uh, there's other teachers out there, too, uh, that are you know, charismatic and the, the money grubbers and that kind of stuff, uh, they have no authority to do what they're doing. See, just, it, see he, if you restrict it to, a, 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 say, if you can say a woman can teach other women, uh, 
there's a problem. The scripture says that the older women are to teach younger women to be good wives and mothers. That's it. Otherwise, you would think this would apply. See, that's the exception. This is the rule. That's the exception. Because no husband's going to object to older women in the church, saintly women, teaching their wives how to be good wives and saintly mothers, are they? Not if they're Christians. But they may object. See, another woman teaching your wife is usurping your authority, the husband's authority. Taking authority that does not belong to them. Because Paul says that the, the woman, if she has questions, is to ask her husband at home. We have to realize that synagogues could be raucous affairs. <laughs> Debates, debating about the meaning of scriptures. And when it, when it says, uh, the King James says silence here, that's not proper. Uh, the New King James follows the King James, says silence, to be quiet, to be restful. Not to be involved in debates with the men. That's the idea. Not to, to refute the, the teacher, say, teacher, I don't agree with you. What about this passage and this passage? Now, maybe that doesn't go on very much in churches today, but it should. It should. You should be able to call the pastor out and say, what do you mean? What, are you sure you're right about this? What about this scripture here and this scripture? This there? If, if people did that in the church, Maybe the pastors would be a little more careful about what they were preaching and how much time they took preparing it, how careful they were about the Scriptures. Call them out. See, there is no... The pastor is not above the men in the church. The, the husband is the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the man. There's no one between the husband or the uh, man and God except Christ. Pastor's not in there. The pastor is to be a servant of the congregation. So it says here, she is not to teach or exercise authority because she doesn't have a legitimate authority. She has no authority legitimately hers to exercise. Why? Paul answers the question in the next verse. Always read the context. For Adam was formed first and then Eve. It's a matter of creation order. Paul rests his argument in the order of creation. Eve was not created. She was formed out of, Ma out of Adam. She was taken out of a rib, was taken from Adam, and from that God formed Eve. So she was truly flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And by the way, we could do that today. It's called cloning. All you'd have to do is take, uh, let's see, the, the women have two Ys or two Xs. Men have an XY, so you remove the, the difference, uh, and you simply duplicate the other chromosome. I don't know if it's XX or, or YY, but uh, that would produce a female. It's all, it was all in Adam. It's just how those things are expressed. And males still have the two chromosomes, and women have a one and a copy, which is totally consistent with what the Bible says. Isn't that interesting? But then some guy like this over here... <laughs> reference the marriage of Adam and Eve going back to the very beginning to establish this concept that a woman singular is not to teach or usurp authority I mean illegally take authority over the man the man is singular it means the husband he is writing about the relationship not between men and women in the church but me, but men and women who are married together No, he's absolutely wrong. It's the uh, man and woman as generic male and female. It's true in the marriage, too, but it's true in all cases. 
it for for a woman to be the head of a nation is shameful. God says the na the judgment is on that nation. It's not right. God says it's wrong. Uh, he he talks about Jeremiah or Ezekiel or uh, excuse me uh, Isaiah talks about uh, women and children rule over them. It was had to do with the judgment of God. It has nothing to do with the equality of man and woman, but the role of man and woman. Because in marriage, you have patriarchy and complementarianism. Equal in the sight of God, different roles. That's what it means. That's established throughout Scripture. But in the church, Jesus is the head of the church. The rest of us are the body. And our roles in the body of Christ as born-again believers has nothing to do with our gender. It has nothing to do with who we're married to. Our marriage is separate from church. Our role in the church, as all members are the bride of Christ, is he's the head, we're the bride, we're the body, we're the born-again believers. And what determines our role? The, holy, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's it. Nowhere in Scripture, in the New Testament, when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are uh, illustrated and wrote about, does it say in any one of the passages, not one, no matter who writes it, including Paul in Ephesians 4, not one time does it say women are excluded from certain gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in Nor does it say horses are excluded, or frogs, or kitties. Uh, argument from <sighs> where does the scripture ever give us examples of women who were called properly pastors and uh, elders and apostles? Nowhere. How come none of the twelve were women? Jesus did have disciples that were women. Uh, some of the women funded him. Yet, none of them were chosen as apostles. The reason for that, because that's God's order. Just like no man is chosen to be a mother. Contrary to God's order. Ephesians 4, Paul specifically writes about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Three of the four he mentions is evangelism, teaching, and pastoring. Did you notice something? How come these nouns suddenly turn, turned into verbs? So let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's see, where is that? I'll just go there, I guess. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. <clears throat> First of all, these are called the ascension gifts because these are gifts given by Christ, not by the Spirit. And so you cannot lump these in with these are people. These are persons given, not gifts. Not as, as an empowerment. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, in my interpretation of those, is these are divine manifestations of the Holy Spirit given according to the will of the, the Holy Spirit as he desires. So uh, say one time a person back in that day might have been prophesying and the next week he might have been ministering or uh, a, a woman in that condition. I don't know. Inside the assembly... So you're also talking among the assembly of the saints. So uh, there, Paul establishes rules for prophecy and rules for tongues. And whether or not women are to be doing that in there. See, this is the problem with the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, and some other movements, is if the, they go by experientialism. The, the scripture's not above experience. Eh? The, back to Wesley's quadrilateral with experience being one of the authorities. So if the church experiences something, if a woman starts speaking in tongues or prophesying, and you believe it's the Holy Spirit doing that, then automatically that overrides scripture. That is what is so dangerous about these movements. They will not subject themselves to the scripture. So uh, they'll... they'll I've seen had many experiences with people like that that they 
they will not abide in the scriptures because, well, the Holy Spirit told me. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict his own words. Now, you would think Paul would then say, but those are only eligible to men to be consistent, right? But he doesn't. Instead, he says, this is for... Yeah, the, uh, it, they're all in the masculine. Not that that necessarily means anything. But again, so if you're going to... Now, we, we have 2,000 years of history here. So if you're going to claim that God calls people, gives people, these are gifts given to the church, if you just read the context here, these are individuals that are given, that function in these roles as apostles and prophets. I would say these are no longer in, in practice because we have the faith that's been delivered once for all unto the saints. So revelatory gifts that, that are giving new teachings are no longer in use unless they're false prophets and false apostles. Because the, the, the faith, we're to contend according to Jude for the faith delivered once for all. That means it was completed. It's that something that's given and done. Just like Christ dying once for all. It's a one-time thing. When the Catholics keep crucifying them over and over and over again, I know they call it representation. It's not. It's wrong. He died once for for all. It's finished, not to be repeated. The same as the revelation to the church in this age was given once for all, principally by the apostles and their associates in the New Testament. It was completed, all of it is it was completed by about 95 with the book of Revelation. But charismatics don't believe that. They just go on and on with their own revelations which is why they're often uh, banana land somewhere. Perfecting the saints, doing the work of ministry, and edifying the body. So the reason I came to 1 Timothy 2 was actually... Was actually for okay, so here's, here's the deal. So if you've got a, a woman pastor, if God's order of authority, as spelled out by Paul, is the husband is or the man, the anner, it's the same word either way, husband or, or man in that case, is the head of the wife, the woman. Now, obviously, the, the man isn't the head of every other woman. So that's talking about inside the marital relationship. And Christ is the head of the man. There's nothing else there. The church is, has no authority over that man as far as God's concerned. The pastor has no authority. Uh, Jesus said it, it's not to be like it is among the Gentiles who exercise authority over others. The, 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 he that would be first among you must be the servant of all. They have nothing but moral authority. They have no authority but the word of God and example. The pastor is trying to assert his authority. It's time to vote with your feet and leave that building for good. Uh, there were some really bad movements among charismatics a number of years ago, quite a few years, decades ago now, called the shepherding movement, where pastors were, you're covering, and they had to, you had to have all your decisions approved by them, including what you bought at the grocery store, who you married, uh, what your career choices were going to be. All these things had to be done under the covering of your pastor. Well, that is somebody who's taken is an antichrist. He has literally usurped the position of Jesus Christ. As John says, you, you uh, Christians really have no need that anyone teach you because you have the Holy Spirit as your teacher. For verses three and four, read this with me. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Think about that for a second. Um, does God want women to be saved? Seems to me he's jumping out of context right now. Does God want women to be saved? What does that have to do with whether women 
are permitted to preach and teach, to pastor and to teach in the church. The church isn't a place of evangelism generally anyway. It's to be the assembly of the saints, which meets for the edification of the saints, to build one another up and to share the Lord's Supper. That's the principal New Testament reason for meeting. To hear the Word of God read, since they didn't have their own copies of the Bible generally, unless you were pretty rich. Or is, talk about when Peter said things were confusing, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. That sounds like a lot of works there. That seems like a lot of work salvation. We know. See, this is a demonstration of the utter ignorance of this person here. Uh, so that, that is again at, let me go back over there. Okay, the word saved, sozo, what does it mean? Well, a few of the meanings is to save, to keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction, to save from suffering, to uh, one suffering from disease, to make well, heal, restore to health, preserve one who is in danger, destruction, to save, to rescue. Perhaps preserved. See what is what is uh, you know through childbearing, not uh, as a result. It's it's not like you're saved onto heaven because you have children. That's an absurd reading. That shows how ignorant this person is of the scriptures. Now you don't have to know any Greek to do that. You just look it up. You know, if you got a you got a concordance, Strong's, Strong's Accordance, look up the meaning of the word. Got a question? Look it up. And the the con and see also this is a contrast Paul's making here between the primary role of the man and the primary role of the woman. The woman as the mother, the wife, and the mother is a different role and it cannot you cannot have the women functioning in a man's role inside the church any without messing up the relation that the church is made up of families so you've got one man's wife ruling over husbands and other men, men's wives and everything else no this is nonsense What's going on here, really, is a person has an agenda, and that agenda is to please the world. And he probably is charismatic, and he's listening to deceitful spirits. And he's, those spirits are his authority, and they're uh, misleading him. They are not leading him to understand the Scripture. They're leading him to teach contrary to Scripture, which makes him an enemy of Jesus Christ. Unknowing, I'm sure, but that's what he's doing. He cannot understand the Scripture because he will not submit to it. Rather, he submits to his own desires and the deception that he considers to be the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is why he can't understand the Scripture. The world's full of people like that. N.T. Wright. As far as I know, he's not a charismatic, but he will not bring himself under the authority of Scripture. The church is full of movements. Going back to, at least to Wesley. <laughs> no, actually, you can go back way farther than Wesley. Of people that refused to abide under the teaching of the Scripture and rather did what was right in their own eyes. And that never works out well. And that's where we are today. 
That is why churches are tripping over themselves to embrace LGBTQ+. Because they're not willing to take up their cross and to follow Christ and to follow his words. Now, Jesus told a parable about a man that built a house in the rock and a man that built his house on the sand. What was the difference? They both heard God's word. They both heard the words of Jesus. But one did what Jesus said, and the other didn't. The other decided to do shortcuts, to do what is what was right in his own eyes. And his house ended up in a bit of a heap flowing down the floodwaters. Whereas the other house that was built on the rock, the rock of the words of Jesus, stood fast. Think about it. You want to follow Christ, or do you want to follow faith on fire because that's where he yeah that might be a little bit prophetic right there <sighs> fire generally has to do with purifying and judgment i believe 